Father, we are grateful for our clarity of understanding and an understanding of the how-tos, the mechanics of the Christian life. Pray that these things would be taught clearly in such a way that we can relate to them and we can use them in our life. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. The world contains two systems. One is God's plan and perspective, and the other is the devil's plan and perspective. Each of us, having been thrust in the middle of this, some say to resolve the angelic conflict, that's, that's my view, we're forced to choose which plan to accept for our own destiny, eternally and temporally. What you believe, it's not if you believe, it's what you believe, determines your eternal destiny and your temporal destiny. The things that we believe day to day, moment to moment, determine the status of our soul, the way that we live out our life, what comes out of us, what's in us, and what comes out of us toward others which is why we've been left. I mean, if this was just about happiness and just about victory, simple victory, salvation, we'd have been gone. But we're left here to fight and to be warriors and to win, to win. So I want to talk tonight. What I want to clarify tonight is... What, what's our part of this? As we walk in the Spirit, as we're filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and we're enlightened, what is it that I do? What is it that God does? We know it's a grace plan. We know that God, we say He does all the work courtesy of Jesus Christ. And yet that can be confusing because we think, well, perhaps I should just be passive. Just be passive. I don't think that's it either. So let's... Now, man was originally free to choose in the garden. Man was free. That's why there was a tree and there was a test. An opportunity to stay with God or an opportunity to fail in... God knew that, that the man would ultimately fail. Talking with a fellow believer the other night, he was confused about all this, you know, the angelic conflict. And I said, well, what's the devil's role in all this? Well, he's going to hell and he wants to take as many people with him as he can. I know you've heard that. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, in the garden, He's there. The very beginning of mankind, he's there with an agenda. He's got an agenda. And that is to destroy us for sure. But God's got an agenda for us as well. And what we believe and how we live this life is going to, is going to determine whether we honor God, whether we please God, whether we do what he sent us here to do or not. So... After the fall, man was con is born condemned with a sin nature and automatically bent toward the devil's way. Independence. Do it my way. Without the Holy Spirit, man is unable to understand spiritual ideas. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 2, I want to show this to you. It's a core idea that Paul teaches about human ability. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Back in verse 10, he's talking about the things that God has prepared for those who love him and is revealed through the Spirit because the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And he goes on and he discusses, verse 14, he says, But the natural man 
the man that's unsaved, the man without the Holy Spirit, the soulish man, literally, the soulish man, the natural man, does not accept the things of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he literally is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned by the Holy Spirit. So, without the Holy Spirit, nothing spiritual happens. Okay? Nothing spiritual happens. In learning to, to interact with the Spirit is one of the great journeys of the Christian life. Because this, you know, see... If your Christian life is, is, is doctrinal principles that become rules, do's and don'ts by which you live your life, you don't even have to be saved to do that, to live by rules. This is a relationship where he speaks to you, where he guides you, he leads you, he encourages you, he he confronts you. You have a relationship. And he enables you to not only understand what this is all about, what your life's about, but what he wants you to do and not do. It's a relationship. And you have to treat it that way. You have to approach it that way. You have to believe that he's in you and that he is speaking to you. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that he's speaking to you every moment of your existence, even when you're asleep, then you won't be listening for him. You won't be listening. And your Christian life won't be a spiritual life. It'll be a life of rules. I'm not anti-rule. Rhonda would probably say I am. But... This is not just a system of rules, a system of do's and don'ts. Even the old covenant law was not rules. It wasn't what it was. It was a revelation of man's inability to be righteous, and the promises were God's promise of a redeemer. Same thing we have. So... With the Spirit, we can understand. Without the Spirit, we can't. Now, we're born into this life trapped in the devil's side of this deal. But God offers us a way out. The convicting ministry of the Spirit enables us to understand the gospel and the choice that must be made. Now, the, the principle that I want to give tonight the one thing that God will never do is coerce the volition and choices of his creatures to force us to believe his way or any other way. This is the one thing. When you, when you become saved and you become indwelt by the Spirit, and when you're filled with the Spirit, you have the power, the capacity to understand your choices. Your volition is now free to choose for God. We're free. Now, that's kind of a trick, but we're technically free. Before we're saved, we're not free. We're chained to the sin nature. Chained to it. It's all, we interpret everything through the sin nature. It's me, 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 me. It's all about me. But in the Christian life, there's another way of looking at things, and it's all about God, putting God at the center. So God is not going to force you to go his way. It defeats his purpose. I believe his purpose is the same as with Job. The devil said to God, take everything from him, like you did me, and he will curse you just like I did. When that didn't happen, they upped the ante, and Job said, threaten, him, threaten his very existence. 
and see what he does. Because that's what you've done with me. You've, you've condemned me to eternal death. And, and how do you think I'm supposed to act? See, the devil's justifying himself the whole way. Justifying himself the whole way. Bottom line, God gets to decide what's right and what's wrong. We get to be examples. When you trust God and you obey God and you stick with God and you're loyal to God under great suffering, you prove this is what they could have had. We're examples of what they could have done, what they could have had. You in your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It takes a lot of different studies to try to put all this together. I'm trying to summarize a few things in a brief time. Ephesians 3, Paul talks about the mystery that has been given to him. He says in verse 2, You've heard of the stewardship or dispensation of God's grace given to me for your sake, so that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before. And he goes on to talk about, and when he gets to verse uh, to me, verse 8, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. Verse 10, so that, here's God's purpose, the manifold, multifaceted wisdom of God might be now, might now be made known through us, through the church, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's fallen angels. God is using us as a demonstration of what He's trying to reveal to all creation, specifically the fallen angels who have accused Him of being unrighteous and unfair. You're, un, you're unfair. Romans 9, hey, didn't you make me this way? How can you blame me now after you made me this way? That's the argument. This is what's going on at the different level than, our, than ours, than the, in the heavenlies. This is what's going on in the courtroom of heaven. All of this accusation this justification, when you stick it out with God and you don't quit, and by that I mean you don't quit growing, you don't quit facing yourself, you don't quit looking for truth, realizing what this is about, surrendering yourself to this. See, when you get to a certain point and you've done good and you've made a name or whatever, you start negotiating with God. I'm in a negotiation with him right now. I mean, I don't really want to go through all the suffering involved of maxing out with God. Facing all that the devil can throw at you and, and sticking it out and being strong through it. You didn't know that's where we were headed, honey, but but I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go there. I'm not gonna veer off. I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna negotiate a deal. Going all the way. All the way. You know, and it's easy to say that and it's easy to talk. It's easy to stand up here and try to be an encouragement to you and go, well, we're going all the way. Listen, you get to a certain point, your body gives up on you and you can't hardly get around and you have things to do and all that and you start to think, geez. <laughs> you, start to, you start to look for a stopping place. Somewhere to pull this thing over and go, there is no such thing. It doesn't exist for the Christian. 
People do it every day, though. Do it every day. And you, listen, each of us, nobody has the right to be critical of another believer's choices in that regard. Each of us has to de determine who we're going to be in the plan of God ourself. You have to do that. You get to do that. And those who will be rewarded and be the greatest to the glory of God will be those that never gave up and never quit. Paul said, I finished the race. Didn't quit. Ran all the way to the end. So, all the way through this, God won't choose for you. So, in Ephesians, if you're in Ephesians, go back to chapter 1, verse 3. I want to show you something about the plan of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 begins the longest sentence in the Bible. It doesn't end till verse 14. 3 through 14 is one sentence. That's one idea. And the first idea... Worthy of praise is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And these blessings are located in the heavenly place. Now here's how I visualize that. Here is eternity past. This, God hasn't even created the universe yet, and He's created our blessings. First thing that God did. This is an aorist participle, and it says he chose us, main verb. The aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. Our blessings came first, even before the universe. Now, God saw you and I way down the corridors of time here, and he saw that you were going to be born and you were going to live this period, and he launched your blessings so that they would hit your life the moment that you needed them, what you needed, where you needed it, when you needed it. The, listen, everything you need has already been launched and has is, and is either been given to you already or is on the way. It's already on the way. Listen, here's the point. You don't do anything for God and he does something in return. Nothing. He's already done it. He's already done it. Turn over to Romans chapter 11. Real quick. Pretty important stuff here. 11, right at the very end of 11. Go to verse 11.33. The depths and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His ways and His judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord or become His counselor? Who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him? You see that? Nobody has ever given to God that God paid Him back. For from him, through him, to him are all things. That's what this is right here. Listen, all of this has been created by God, set into motion, and when you need it, it's going to be right where you are. Boom, it's going to fall right where you are in your life. That's grace. That's the grace program. The question in what this is about tonight, what I want to talk about, is what is our part of this? I mean, look, God's done it all. Created the universe, created the air we breathe, gave us this body, gave us this angelic conflict we're in. He gave us our Bible and gave us our church and our pastor and our teachers and our fellowship. He gave us everything. Gave us everything. But, but, our job is not to just sit here and let it fall. It's, we've got a role in this. And our role is volition. It is what we believe. 
It's a little bit more complex than that. So, what is God's job in the grace system and what is man's job in the grace system? Let's talk about the ministry of the Spirit. Here are these different ministries. First, the filling ministry. Now, Ephesians 5.18 says, Be filled with the Spirit. We believe that means to be in fellowship with the Spirit. The word plero means to be totally influenced, fully influenced by someone. It means to be under the influence of the Spirit. You know, he gives, he, he says, don't be drunk with alcohol. Don't be under the influence of spirits, but be under the influence of the Spirit. Well, it's a passive voice verb, meaning the subject receives the action. Who does that action of filling? Holy Spirit. But it's a command, and therefore we have a role in it. Whenever there's a command, it means we have to choose. So what is it that we choose? Confess our sins and be under his influence. We have to choose to hear him, to see what he's showing us, to listen, to be compliable, to be willing to do what he asked. We have to do that. That's our part. He won't do it for you. Now, he gives you the desire. Philippians 2.17. God produces the desire. You don't even have that desire as an unbeliever. Everything's about me. But as a believer, the spirit cranks up desire. We'll see it next. Now, go to, you're in Romans. Go to Galatians 5. This is one of Ron's favorite passages. And I want to give it a little expanded idea about it. Because we normally read verse 16, I say, walk by means of the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But read verse 17. For the flesh produces a desire against the Spirit, and the spirit, a desire against the flesh, for these in are in opposition to one another, that, so that you often do not do what you wanted to do. You get tempted away. Now, what, what in, that, in that encounter right there with the Holy Spirit, we're to walk. The word walk is an active voice verb. That's our job is to walk. And the way that you walk is by remaining in an obedient posture with God. You stay filled. You, you're, you've confessed, you're back in fellowship, and you stay in fellowship. That's walking. One decision, you obey God. The next decision, you obey God. The next decision, you obey God. Now you're walking. So you don't, you don't avoid the fulfilling the desires of the flesh by being filled with the Spirit. You have to walk and get momentum. See the difference? You can confess your sin in your field. That's what we believe. But that's not walking. Walking is staying filled and making choices one after the next to stay in obedience to God. But... He says, the spirit, he says, the flesh, and listen, here's how this works. This is really important to understand. Here's how it works. Some will tell you that this, that this also nature will produce a sinful desire. No. Desire is just a normal part of the soul. Desire has, is it neither good or bad. In fact, it's just a reflection of the fact that you have needs. How do you know you have needs? You feel your needs as desires. Simple as that. Now, you can attach your desire 
to the sin nature, he calls it the flesh, you can attach it or you can attach your desire to God the Holy Spirit. We, get, we decide what we're going to do with our desire. You see, all of a sudden you have a desire for something. And you, have, you stop and ask yourself, okay, how am I going to meet that desire? Am I going to try to gratify it my way, any way possible, in my timing, in my system? Or am I going to trust the Lord to gratify or satisfy that need, desire, in His time? That's the difference. This is called walking in the Spirit. You, you, you trust your desires and therefore your needs to God for Him to fulfill them in His time, in His way. When you fail to do that, how many times in your life have you wanted something? And rather than wait on God, you went after it. And I don't mean it has, it has like a drug deal or something. I mean, you know, you wanted, you wanted your partner to go along with you on something. Instead of waiting and trusting the Lord to work all that out, you went into manipulation mode. Hello? That's what I'm talking That's That's giving in to the flesh. So, our part is to take our desire. You know what's hard about all this? Is you have to be aware of what's going on inside of you. That's the hard part. Most of us are so accustomed to living outside of ourselves, focused on the circumstances of our life, depending on those circumstances, on whether we're having a good day or not, or whether we're having a good life or not, whether we've been successful or not, when those things really have very little to do with God's view of it, what God's looking at is inside. Now, if you're an extrovert, that's more difficult than if you're an introvert. Extroverts do live outside. They like to be in the interacting with people in circumstances and they're doers and they like to be going and going. Introverts like me, we live in here, so it's easier. You know, maybe, I don't know. It just seems like it. Thirdly, enlightenment. If you're, if you're in Galatians, go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul's prayer. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. And there's our idea. The word means to give light. Photizo. And it's a passive voice, meaning the Spirit does the work of, of enlightening us. The Spirit sheds the light. And when He does, when He turns on the light in your soul, you will be able through the Spirit, to see the hope of His calling, the riches of His glorious inheritance, and the surpassing greatness of, him, of His power toward us who believe. Three categories. Now, He gives the light. See that, right? The enlightenment, passive voice. God sheds the light. But who controls what the eyes of your heart see? We do. Absolutely we do. Talking to a young person about sadness and struggles they were going through and trying to explain the reason you're feeling what you're feeling is because of the images that you're creating in your mind. You're using the eyes of your heart connected to your sin nature to create images of loss, 
images of failure, images of being without. You're creating these images, and every time you create that and you see it in your mind, you go, oh, oh. Listen, you do it over and over again, your whole life, and now you've ingrained that in yourself so that it's just habit, habit, habit to look on the negative. It's just habit to go to the fear. Oh, 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 oh. Paul says, the Spirit gives light, but you have to choose to take what the Spirit has described in the Word and visualize that. I mean, when, when, when the Bible says, visualize the hope of His calling, what does that mean to you? What do you see? I mean, I see heaven. I see the word hope means confidence. I see I'm going to be there. I see the door open. I see the invitation. That's what I see. And then he says, they're surpassing what is the riches of his glorious inheritance. And I'm, I'm there coming in the front door, and there's a, a, the coat, you know, to kill the fatted calf, the ring, the whole thing, the prodigal son. I mean, that's what I see. You know, you, know, you got to see it your way. God, the Holy Spirit, will give you an image for you to see related to the Scripture. Every time we have a choice to walk in the Spirit or walk in the flesh, we do that because of what we do with the eyes of our heart and with our inner dialogue. You know, last night Ron talked about inner dialogue. you got to be talking to the Spirit, and that's exactly right. You got to be talking to the Spirit. So, the believer takes charge of the eyes of his heart, looking for the light given by the Holy Spirit. I've, I've been able to take people who had formed tremendous negative habits of seeing fearfulness, anger, frustration, and help them erase those. Over and over, every time it popped up, erase it and replace it with these things that, that the Spirit reveals. And this person's life, which is bogged down in so many mental sins, begins to change. They begin to strengthen and get up and move out in a good way simply because what they choose to see in their mind. And what they say. The Holy Spirit empowers us. The fourth one. And this power has to do with the ability to understand. If you'll go to Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. This is another prayer. For this reason I bow my knees, verse 14, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the power to comprehend or understand with all the saints the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, surpassing knowledge, that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. See, that's power. Power to understand. Power to comprehend. Power to be able to grasp. You don't start off as a new believer with that power. Listen, that is something that is developed through enlightenment, and, and grasping that and seeing that and practicing that and building on that and building on that and building on that. Have you not seen over the years how you've just built? How your insight and discernment and understanding just continues to slowly just evolve? Boom. Next thing you know, boom. It opens up more. 
and you can see it more, and you're walking closer, you hear him more. This is the, our part of that is by entering into that journey with him. Entering into that journey. Understanding the mechanics on our part. So, the guiding ministry, John 16, 13, and Romans 8, 14, he guides us into all truth. He does this by giving us light, giving us power to understand about our needs and desires, and therefore, see, look here just a second. See, this is how we come into the Christian life with this right here. John 7, 37 through 39, the empty place. Jesus said, any man who's thirsty, come to me and drink. And he, and, he said that, and he spoke about the emptiness in man that the spirit would come to indwell. It's the empty place is what creates this hunger in us. And so we begin to learn that God has a plan to fulfill our life, to fulfill our hunger. We already know there's a plan to do it our way. We've been doing that the whole time. From birth, from the day you're born, to the day you're born again, all you have is that. And you build these habits and ingrain this in your soul so that this is just what this is just automatic. Boom, boom, boom. Default. The default. So, but one day you begin to go, all right, I'm going to say no to that and yes to the Spirit. I'm going to listen to the Spirit. Spirit gives you an understanding, an image of trusting God. And you go, I'm going to do that. The next thing you know, you begin to build. You begin to build. You build momentum. You build up. Bob Thing called it an edification complex because that's what it is. It's a structure that builds inside of you. Principle upon principle upon principle and concept on concept. Idea upon idea. And all of that fits together. And listen, that's the journey. The journey to build that. Once you get that built, then you go after and have to get rid of this one. If you want this one to be fully functional in your life, you can't just let that lie. You say, well, I'll keep it pushed down. That's what we try to do. It won't work. It's like, it's like trying to take a balloon and it's try, like trying to compress a balloon. You know, what happens if you push it in the middle? Boom, pops out on either end. The whole system's that way. So, and finally, the fruit, literally the fruit comes from, as we develop the mindset, these, these, the thinking and the images that go with the Spirit, it begins to produce. Here's an example. I mean, we are in uh, this transition in our church, in this transition. Now, we can visualize and verbalize with our inner dialogue all types of scenarios where everything fails, where we just fall apart and the whole thing ends and it's the stupidest thing we ever... I mean, we can imagine a million of those scenarios, and apparently some of us are doing that again and again and again. And I understand that. I mean, I do that in areas of my life. But there's also, this, what's the Spirit saying? What's the Spirit saying? What's the, what image is He giving? The image He gives me, and I'll just share this with you, is, the, is of the grace message. Continuing. Now, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what kind of building that's in. I don't know how... Uh, who all's in, I just know the grace message has got to carry on, and God's going to do it. My prayer is that I get to be part of that, that I don't end up just stuck in some corner somewhere and not able to participate in that, or be stuck out in the countryside with nobody else who's interested in that, hungry for that, going on that journey. There's got to be others to go on that journey, and here we are. 
What are your images? What are you seeing in your mind? What are you playing over and over again? Listen, if it's producing fear, I don't think it's from the Lord. I don't think it's from the Lord. All right, let's talk about growth. Everything spiritual that happens inside the believer is, is because of the ministry of the Spirit. Don't ever misunderstand the things I'm saying. I'm not saying that man chooses or does anything apart from the Spirit. Now, we, we talked about desire. First <clears throat> Peter 2.2. 2. Uh, turn over to First Peter 2.2 2 for a second. And, and First Peter 2.2, 2, all the way to the right. Almost to the end. Now we read this wrong quite often. He says in verse 1, Therefore laying aside one of Paul's favorite ideas, all malice, guile, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, and like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Often we read that as if, if you are a newborn babe, you will desire, you will automatically desire the milk of the word. Guess what? That word is an aorist imperative, aorist active imperative, meaning that you have to actively desire it, and it's a command that you have to choose to desire it. And here's what you have to do. You have to choose to take your desire and attach it to the milk of the Word. So you wouldn't be here if you hadn't done that. You wouldn't be here so faithfully if you had not already taken the hunger of your soul and attached it to God and His Word. And locked it on. You got to do that. See, it's not a consequence of being born again. It doesn't automatically happen. We have to choose it. We have to choose to, to keep it up. The desire is our part. The Spirit, see, we naturally have desire from our needs. The Spirit gives us a desire to connect with God. But we have to manage that desire by attaching it in the right way to the right things. Then we have to hear. God makes available everything the believer needs to understand and do His will. All through history, God has made available whatever a believer needed to do what God wanted. I, every bit. So God is going to make available. See, I understand some people think, where am I going to go to hear the Word? I mean, if we move, and if that doesn't work, and if Ron goes down, which he eventually will, where, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? Where am I going to go to hear the Word? God's going to provide it. So you've got to have that picture. You've got to picture that. God's going to provide it. You can't let this image of, of, of failure, of nothingness, you can't let that be in your soul. You, when it pops up in there, you've got to erase that thing. Blow it up. Erase it and replace it. So you've got to hear. Then you've got to believe. This is what we call positive volition. You inhale the word for the purpose of assimilating it into a belief system. Listen, you don't just come as a ritual to hear. You come to hear, to understand, and to assimilate these concepts into a perspective and a viewpoint so that you can apply it to your life. See God's will in it. That comes from faith. If you hear the word, no matter how well it's taught, but you're not willing to believe it, to assimilate it, it will remain a theory. Watch. You got the mind and the heart. The information comes into the mind and you reach a conclusion. 
It's only when you believe it that it transfers over to your heart and becomes part of your belief system. It's by believing it that it becomes, becomes part of your belief system, and then when circumstances arise, it's believing it to apply it. See, it's faith coming in and faith going out. You believe it to apply it. Here's the, here's the trick. Circumstance pops up. You have the choice of going with the sin nature and the belief system that's come out of that one, the old man, or you got a choice of going with the spirit and the new man belief system. You can do either one. Now, here's what you need to understand. A couple things. One, we hear that and we think that we're in a neutral place. See, here's Al sitting on neutral. It's not true. When that circumstance pops up, I'm either over here in the spirit or I'm over here in the flesh. There is no in-between. Right? There's no in-between. So when the circumstance pops up, you're either in one or the other. If you're over here in the flesh, odds are you're going to stay in the flesh Images are going to pop up of, of everything coming apart and everything going bad and blah, 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 and you're going to be afraid and angry and frustrated, and that's our normal habit of life. As that begins to happen, though, you can, you've, you've got your volus, you go, whoa, stop, 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 stop. Stop. Nope. Erase that. And you look over here to the Spirit, and he goes, bingo. Here, I've got a better image for you. Let me show you what's available to you. Let me show you what's going to happen with all this. You got a flat tire on the interstate and you go, well, you think the Spirit's going to tell me who's going to pull up and help me? No, the Spirit's going to show you that no matter what happens circumstantially, that, that He still got you. He still got you. That's what I would encourage you to think about all of this going on with our church, that no matter what circumstantially goes on, he still got us. He ain't letting us go. He ain't going to let us fall. So, we believe to assimilate and we believe to apply. And it's by speaking truth with one another. I'll tell you, some of you have been around a pretty long time, long as, longer than me even. I've been here 37 years, off and on. When I first came here, the discussions that we had about the Word of God and Bible doctrine and the insights and understandings that we gave each other and the times that we had discussing these things, phenomenal. I hunger for those days. A hunger for the days when we discussed things that were real. There was an openness to do so. We were all so new and striving to get a grip and understanding of what our life was now and what all was available. And we were just learning, 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 learning and just so caught up in it. That was exciting for me. That was a wonderful time. Speaking the truth in love. We, we, we edify one another. Purification. This is something I've been emphasizing for a while. Uh, see, I believe that when we're first born, when we're born initially, we develop this old way based on the old sin nature, the devil's world. Our volition and the sin nature form a belief system. Paul calls the old man that we operate under and we turn it into a subconscious habit of living, it's the default. It's, see, we, when we, as soon as we let go of the Spirit, listen, you let go of the Spirit, you don't go to neutral. Boom. You go to here. You're back over here. And 
it's important to understand that trying to hang on to the Spirit, to consciously, volitionally hang on to the Spirit every second of your life, you know, it's like going down the interstate on a, on a moped. It's not meant to be that way. What's meant to happen? See, we, we, we learn things, we believe them, they become part of our heart, and we use them in our life and they become habits. It's just how it works. It's got how the design works. It just, we just habituate these ideas in our life and we build these patterns. I learned this in, by counseling relationships. People would come again and again and again with the same pattern. And they would say, you know, I see it coming back. I know that within a week or so we're going to be fighting again. Well, how do you know that? Because I've been through this cycle over and over and over, and I see the pattern. It's like, wow, what is that? It's just habits, just old habits. When you adopt an idea into your heart and you use it a number of times, it becomes an unconscious habit. That simple. You build all these up together in the old man, and you got a whole system by which you live your life apart from God. When you let go of the Spirit, womb, you're back over here. So, Paul says that you're supposed to take this off. Now, that's the hard part. It's the part that people really don't want, want to hear. They don't want to do it. It's really hard. Some of us got some really mean, bad stuff in there that we've suppressed that we don't want to deal with or look at. We don't think it's necessary. And we just tell ourselves, you know, I got enough doctrine. I got enough. I got enough of where I'm at. I'm just going to ride this thing out. Just going to coast this thing on out to the end. I understand that. I do. It's not God's will, but I understand it. You have to confess sins, 1 John 1, 9. By confessing sin, when you confess the same sin over and over again, you begin to see patterns. And when you start to look at the thinking behind your sins, the images that you make, the inner dialogue that you perform, you start to listen to yourself you begin to realize why you commit the same sins over and over again. Because you have a pattern of behavior. Patterns. And so when you see these patterns, you can begin to anticipate them, and as they are about to take you over again and force you into this bad behavior cycle, you can go, no. No. This is what happens when you grow in your marriage. You know, everybody's got their cycles they go through, and in your marriage, you just, it's just repeating, repeating, repeating. And then one day you start to grow, and you begin to see this thing coming, and you, it's about to be upon you again, and you go, no, I'm not going there this time. The other person isn't ready, so they keep, and they're up there doing their little dance, their little anger dance, and you're over here sitting in the chair going, have at it. One day this person looks around and goes, well, when would you quit dancing? Hello, now we're making progress because we broke the patterns, removed them from our life. We no longer think about the relationship that way. We think about the relationship from the, we, we have images from the spirit that we use to think about the relationship. The spirit says, Romans 8, 28, Gosh, I know that's been difficult, but look what it's done for you. Look how you've grown. Look how you've had to depend on God instead of yourself. <laughs> See, that's the... But look, it's our part of this is to participate with the Spirit. To look, to listen, to obey, to ask, to break patterns, to habituate new ones. Develop the new man. You, you get into love and intimacy with God. This is, listen, the mechanics are critical. You can't get here without mechanics. If people tell you what to do, but never tell you how to get there, that's just so frustrating to me. 
We love to listen to Joel on Sunday morning, uh, Osteen. Rhonda loves to catch his joke. He always starts with a joke. And look, Joel, he's, everything he says is encouraging. It's all, he's a great exhorter, you know, everything God's going to come through for you. It's a great image. I mean, I don't like listening to him. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't grow under him, but, you know, if I needed to be encouraged, that he'd be all right. But my point being, the mechanics of how to get to these places, to this mature state, critical. Can't get there unless you understand the Word of God and the, and the things the Word of God teaches, the, what the Spirit has made available for us to access and use to get where we need to get. But if you'll take that journey, as you get down the road a ways, you, become, you start to become aware of the Lord in a really personal way. And here, see, purification is so difficult Letting go of your old patterns is so difficult and so personal. See, it's not doctrine. It's not mechanics. It's, it's me. It's my crap. It's what was done to me and what I did because of what was done to me. It's my defense mechanisms. It's these rooms I've got full of pain that I've got all shut off. It's all kinds of crazy stuff. If you're going to deal with that, you gotta, you got to have the Lord. You can't do it yourself. It's too hard. But if you'll believe that He's with you when you go to that room and open that door, I mean, that pain right there has been in your life 40 years and it's interfering with your ability to conduct your marriage. Your children won't even get near you because of that pain and you've tried to keep it all boxed up, but it leaks out everywhere in your life. And you know, God has been telling you, you got to deal with that. Got to deal with that. So one day you get enough courage to go over there and open that door, and you think it's going to be a monster. That's the biggest monster in my soul. And you and Jesus get your flashlight out because it's dark in there, and you walk in there, and listen, it's a little kid sitting in the corner crying, hurt, abandoned, forlorn. And what he needs is love, not a monster. It's you. You locked you up. It's through this process that everything gets personal with God. Really personal. I pray that for you. I, ho I hope that you... Either know that or find that. And she said, and boy, was she right. And that's when you begin to be able to love others. I hope this has been helpful to you.